Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to our patient and public um, involvement evening, um, otherwise known as PPI. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Barker. Um, I'm the uh, Professor of, of uh, Medical Dermatology here at St. John's Institute of Dermatology um, in London. Um, and I'm also one of the consultants in the Sarasis service um, here at St. John's. Um, and I'm currently um, honored to be president of the International um, Sarasis uh, Council. Um, now tonight we're doing the PPI event um, in collaboration with the uh, Sarasis Association of Great Britain. And we're very pleased that Helen McAteer, the chief executive is going to join us later on uh, for the Q and A. Um, we're going to talk primarily about research, um, and, but we want to do it with your involvement. Um, and one of the real reasons for doing this with the Sarasis Association is, as many of you will know, uh, last Friday was the uh, 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 World Sarasis Day, uh, which is an event championed by the WHO, um, put together by the International Federation of Sarasis Associations. Um, so it's, a, it's an important part of the year uh, for all stakeholders in Sarasis. Uh, the theme for this year's World Sarasis Day was United. Um, and we feel that, that it's important that we as healthcare professionals um, are united with the public and patients um, around trying to do better for Sarasis. Um, and we not only want to do better for psoriasis in the UK, but around the world. We're well aware that there are many issues that get in the way of optimizing care, um, and we, we stand united trying to, to do better. Um, and to, tonight, we're going to talk about trying to do better with research. And so with that, let's go on to the program. Um, and you will see that we're going to have three talks um from the from our faculty um and then there's going to be um a q a um uh, uh session at the end so without further ado i'm going to hand over to our first speaker who is dr satvir mahil satvir um is um, a clinical academic uh, dermatologist um who who not only does general dermatology but works um, in the sarasis service um, Satvia did her PhD on um, psoriasis, and since she's been made a consultant, she has continued to do great research um, in, in psoriasis, not only looking at immunology and genetic mechanisms in psoriasis, but since the start of the pandemic, has worked unbelievably hard to put together the global um, uh, registry, or two actually, So Protect and So Protect Me, and Satver, I think you're going to talk to us particularly about So Protect Me. Over to you. That's right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And it's, um, it's great to be here today with everyone. And thank you so much to everyone, as Jonathan said, for joining us um, this evening. So as Jonathan mentioned, my talk is going to be focused on So Protect Me, um, which is something that we set up in the pandemic. And it's been a huge team effort supported by the Psoriasis Association. Um, so. The scale of the pandemic is huge. And um, when we think about the number of cases, it tots up at the moment to 243 million cases worldwide, 4.9 million deaths. But actually a chart like this, as we see here, doesn't fully capture the, the full scale of the pandemic because it's impacted us in, in just so many ways. So what does it mean for individuals with psoriasis? Um, so we all know that psoriasis is a common skin condition and it's immune mediated. It's associated with long-term health conditions and is treated with drugs that affect the immune system. And very early on in the pandemic, people with long-term conditions and those who were on drugs that affect the immune system, otherwise known as immunosuppressants, were identified as being at high risk of severe COVID. And um, as you will know, um, this group of individuals were advised to shield um, during the pandemic and, of course, more recently have been prioritised for the COVID vaccine. 
So we sought to fully understand the impact of the pandemic on individuals with psoriasis globally. And two sort of key things that we wanted to cover. First of all, we wanted to characterize the course of COVID in people with psoriasis, and in particular, identify the specific factors that, was, that were associated with severe COVID in this population. And secondly, to understand the experiences of um, people with psoriasis in the pandemic to ultimately help to inform priorities for healthcare. And specifically, we focused on looking at risk mitigating behaviors, so shielding, as um, I mentioned just before, medication behaviors pertaining to drugs that affect the immune system, and more latterly, vaccination uptake, vaccination he hesitancy, and also to reflect on access to psoriasis care during the pandemic. So we set up So Protect, which is a global registry for clinicians to report outcomes of COVID in individuals with psoriasis. And this was launched in March. And this is the website that um, our clinicians use globally to report um, infections of COVID-19 in individuals with psoriasis in their patients. Now, So Protect Me is a companion global registry for people with psoriasis to self-report their experiences of the pandemic. And we were keen to understand the experiences, whether or not um, you've had COVID. The questions that we asked in So Protect Me are closely aligned with So Protect, but because we were asking individuals with psoriasis directly, we were able to embed screening tools for depression and anxiety in the question in, in So Protect Me, specifically ask about shielding behaviours, perceptions of um, or experiences of access to psoriasis care and disruptions in psoriasis care during the pandemic, and vaccination uptake and medication use. This is the, the website and we are actively collecting data. So please do, if um, you've not entered data into So Protect Me yet, please do go to the website and um, enter um, the information for us. It takes about five minutes to complete. It's available in multiple different languages because we were really keen to make this a truly global effort. And we have been, uh, incredibly fortunate and we're very grateful for all of the support that we've received over the past 18 to 20 months um, by all of these partner organizations, both um, partner professional organizations and patient organizations and the Psoriasis Association was, was one of them who supported us. We have also um, developed great links with partner registries. So these are efforts in other diseases and um, very much aligned to what we've been doing in psoriasis. And in particular, we've been able to do pooled analyses of data um, using rheumatology data and inflammatory bowel disease data. So going on to how far we've come. So in So Protect, we now have 1,272 clinician reported cases of COVID in psoriasis. And you can see the, um, the, the spread there amongst the countries with Europe in particular, very well represented. And then So Protect Me. So we've had 4,791 people with psoriasis um, have completed So Protect Me. And you can see 50% from the UK, but there's been um, a, a true um, global participation there, including South America, North America. So what have we learned? The first things, the, the first thing that we looked at and the first thing we were keen to understand very quickly is what were the risk factors for severe COVID in individuals with psoriasis. Um, and we used our So Protect data for this and um, we published this research paper last year. We found that um, most patients who were being reported to So Protect by their clinicians were receiving drugs that affect the immune system. So 70% were on a biologic and um, had COVID in our So Protect data set. But very reassuringly, more than 90% of the patients reported fully recovered from COVID. So that as an initial bit of data was very reassuring. And then we looked to understand the risk factors associated with hospitalization and we found very um, much that the risk factors were the same as what had been reported and found in the general population. So um, severe COVID was associated with male sex, older age, non-white ethnicity, and other health conditions, in particular, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, liver disease, heart disease. 
And we published this, as I mentioned last year, and we've just recently updated the analysis because our data set has grown considerably over time and all of this still holds true. And we found um, potential differences between treatment groups. And we broadly here looked at non-biologics versus biologics. And we found that hospitalization for COVID was associated with non-biologic immunosuppressants compared to biologics. And we weren't alone in finding this trend also in the rheumatology data sets and in the inflammatory bowel disease data sets, the same was found. But um, it's really important to understand the limitations of this data. And importantly, these are not causal observations. So for example, these differences that we saw between drug groups, it may be due to other unmeasured factors associated with, for example, biologics use. And I'll come to that in a moment. And it's always important to um, remember the selection bias with these registry type data sets, because our data set is, of course, dominated by um, patients taking biologics. And it's probably because um, it's hospital doctors and nurses who are completing um, the so protect um, form. So it's already skewed towards that. And we were unable to ascertain the incidence of COVID in those receiving particular treatments. We next went on to look at behaviours, and in particular shielding behaviour, and this is where we use the so protect me data set, so what patients had reported to us. And we did in fact find that shielding was more common in those receiving biologics compared to those receiving non-biologics or standard systemic treatments or no systemic treatment. So it could be that greater shielding behaviour amongst those who are on biologics may well be contributing to this reported lower risk of severe COVID that we saw in the, in the SOProtect data set that I've just described. We also found that individuals who had underlying health conditions, joint disease and males were more likely to shield. And we were able to pool our So Protect Me data with a, um, an aligned data set from rheumatology called Core UK to do this analysis. So our numbers um, were, were, were very good. We had 3,720 patient responses to analyze for this um, piece of work. And then the next theme was we were keen to understand the burden of the pandemic in people with psoriasis. What happened to people's psoriasis during the pandemic with the various stresses and strains of, um, of the time and potentially the impact of the medications, say that they were stopping or starting. We found that 43% of patients who reported um, to So Protect Me reported that their psoriasis worsened during the pandemic. And we had data from just over 4,000 people to look at for this. We found that um, worsening of psoriasis was associated with anxiety and depression during the pandemic. Females seem to be disproportionately affected by worsening psoriasis during the pandemic. And importantly, there you can see the blue bar, not taking your psoriasis treatment was associated with worsening disease. And in fact, when we looked into that closely, 18% of people who were taking a, an injection treatment or a tablet treatment for their psoriasis, so a systemic immunosuppressant, stopped or delayed their medication during the pandemic. And overwhelmingly, this was due to concern regarding complications from COVID. And a positive mental health screen, so a positive anxiety or depression screen was more common in those who stopped or delayed their medications. More recently, we've um, looked at vaccine hesitancy. So this is um, we, when we ascertained vaccine hesitancy, we asked a very simple question as to whether um, the individual who's filling in So Protect Me had received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine or was intending to receive it. And um, vaccine hesitancy was defined as those who had not received it or were not intending to receive it, so had declined. 81% um, of respondents had received at least one dose of the vaccine at the time of the analysis, and we had 755 um, total respondents uh, to look at. And 8.3% of um, patients completing So Protect Me had declined the vaccine. So overwhelmingly, the vast majority of people were planning on having it or had already had it. 
And then when we uh, look at trends for vaccine hesitancy, we found actually that um, hesitancy seemed to be more predominant in those who were of a younger age, so those under the age of 31, and those of non-white ethnicity. And when we dug deeper into the reasons behind the vaccine hesitancy that we saw reported, the three top reasons were being worried about the side effects for the vaccine, feeling that the vaccine was too new, and lastly, being worried that their psoriasis will worsen. And the final thing that we looked at was access to psoriasis care and asking the simple question, has it been disrupted during the pandemic? And 40% of respondents reported that access to their care for psoriasis had been disrupted. So they either strongly agreed or moderately agreed. And when we again looked at the trends amongst the individuals who um, answered that their care had been disrupted, it seemed to be that it was more predominant in, again, those of a younger age group, those of non-white ethnicity. And this led us to do an association analysis to see if the, there was an association between those who had had disrupted psoriasis care and re those reporting vaccine hesitancy. And actually, when we adjusted for age and sex, there was no clear association there. So it looks to be two um, independent uh, factors there. So the data we've been really keen to feed back in real time as we've been collecting it, as we've been analysing it. And we do so through our current data pages on both the So Protect website and the So Protect Me website. So please, if you've not visited these pages, please do, because there's nice summaries of the data. There's links to all of our research publications that um, we have published. And we have designed um, infographics to summarize neatly some of the key headlines um, from the findings. So the one on the left is around the SoProtect paper that I mentioned at the beginning, and then the one on the right here is um, around uh, the burden of the pandemic and, and worsening psoriasis. We have been, we've tried to be very active with disseminating our findings to try to feed back um, to you know, everybody who has contributed and beyond um, to these research efforts. So we've done videos and podcasts, um, produced blogs and newsletters. Uh, we've been very fortunate to team up with the Psoriasis Association, IFPA and the Global Psoriasis Atlas um, to um, manage the social media side of things. And, and you know, we can't thank everybody enough for the effort and the careful attention that's gone into disseminating all of this information. And there's been PPI webinars such as tonight and scientific meetings that um, we've presented at. And the research has come into clinical practice and there are key statements that have been produced and released by the IPC, the International Psoriasis Council, and um, by societies in the US, um, sort of building and using the data that we have collated and that we've analysed amongst other data sources to try to sort of bring about clear um, guidance for clinicians and for patients during the pandemic. And these are two examples here. So thank you. Um, and uh, I mean, Jonathan and Catherine have, have um, really headed this with me and with Chris Griffiths up in Manchester. And, you know, on behalf of everyone, we, we're so grateful for everybody's support. We've had a huge study team, or, you know, they're, they're listed there and a great international um, input from clinicians and from academics and from our patient partners as well with Helen's on the call today from the Psoriasis Association. Helen and her team have been fantastic in, in really um, helping us to take this forward. So thank you very much. Uh, sat there, um, um, thanks so, so much for that. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to questions for you at the end, if I may. So people, please, we've, we've had a few questions, so uh, keep them coming in, um, um, and so we can have a lively Q&A uh, later. Um, so, but thank you, Satvir. Um, but we're now going to uh, move on to um, uh, Lucy Moorhead. Uh, Lucy um, is the nurse consultant in the Sarasis service. Um, and um, we, as a service, have um, embraced 
the need for good nursing care and nursing management of our patients um, because it's a really complicated business um, and, and much of it is beyond the ability of, of uh, medics and is much better suited to the uh, nursing environment and Lucy heads that up and does, uh, does great work um, uh, making sure that, that, that psoriasis management is good. So good, in fact, that she recently won an award, did you not? A national award yes. from the, uh, 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 the, the British Dermatology Nursing Group. Um, and we are extremely proud that you've done that, Lucy. Anyway, okay. you're going to talk about itching to talk. So I'm here to introduce um, everybody to a, a discussion guide which can help people prepare for their appointments. Um, and this was developed in collaboration with the Psoriasis Association and also for Amgen. Um, OK, and if anyone is more technologically advanced than me, uh, you can actually scan this code and access the guide now, um, or it is also downloadable from the Psoriasis Association website. And actually all the information that I'm providing tonight is available on the Psoriasis Association website. Um, so this work was a culmination of basically two years work. And as I said, it was a collaboration between Amgen and Psoriasis. And what it was designed to do was to meet the unmet needs of patients who have been diagnosed or, or have a, a diagnosis of moderate psoriasis with the understanding that having moderate disease doesn't necessarily mean that your psoriasis has a moderate impact on your life. And, um, and so basically this work was to look at the unmet needs and to improve care for these patients. But I think the resulting guide that's come out of it is actually useful for patients um, across the board, sort of regardless of your severity of psoriasis. Um, in order to provide sort of the best uh, possible resource that they could, um, the, uh, there was a panel uh, a, a range of experts, including specialist nurses, uh, people who are living with psoriasis, representation from the support groups and also doctors as well. And these are the names of the people who took part um, in, the, in the boards and helped develop this um, resource. Um, and so, as I said, it's basically looking at understanding uh, people who the needs of people who are living with moderate psoriasis um, the psoriasis association collected market research which developed a clear understanding of moderate patients and also helped the psoriasis communication community differentiate between mild moderate and severe patients and also to identify the unmet needs of this group in particular because patients who often have very localized psoriasis uh, predominantly maybe affecting the groin or the face are often uh, um, often, you know, defined as having moderate psoriasis, but actually these are thought to be high impact sites. And so the impact on people's lives, um, you know, it, it is great and definitely not moderate. And again, the research showed that there was a disconnect in communication between moderate patients and also specialists. And so there was a need to to facilitate or help provide better conversations between patients and all healthcare professionals to make consultations more effective. Um, so what was the new resource thought to need to explore? Um, it, the goal was to assess treatment goals and also to build a complete picture of the patient and really look at holistic care, which is something that I know we all try to do in the psoriasis service. So firstly, asking patients to think about or people to think about how would life be different if their psoriasis cleared up, how to maximise consultation time. Often consultation times can feel pressurised. Um, you may be kept waiting for a while for your consultation. Um, and, you know, in order to make the most of that time, you know, it, it's advised that you can, you know, take photographs if you have flares in between appointments, um, being able to you know, maybe not be embarrassed at, at, at sort of asking questions and explaining where you have psoriasis. And, I, you know, as a healthcare professional, really didn't like reading this, but the perception that, that some healthcare professionals were disinterested as well. Um, also looking at the impact of your psoriasis on people's lives. So, you know, how does it impact work, family and hobbies? We have a questionnaire where we ask patients, um, you know, how over the last seven days, how has your psoriasis stopped you from going to the gym? And many of our patients will tick, oh, not applicable. But actually, when you when you question um, why they've ticked not, not applicable, um, 
I'll often get a story back similar to, well, I haven't been to the gym for 10 years because my, you know, because my psoriasis is so bad. And actually, you'd argue that actually it's not not applicable. It's actually, you know, very that that their skin has very much affected their day to day living. Um, looking at uh, the impact of current treatments and are there any obstacles to adherence, particularly with topical regimes? I know we try to sort of work with we work with people to find topical regimes that kind of fit in with people's lives. Um, the DLQI is a dermatology life quality index. So that's, we have a PARSI score, which grades the severity of psoriasis, but it is an objective score. So it should, we, you know, would always do the PARSI score in combination with a quality of life questionnaire so that we have a picture of how um, skin disease is impacting patients' everyday life. Um, and also balancing the importance of psoriasis location as well as the extent on skin involvement. So for instance, recognizing that localized scalp, nail, genital, or facial psoriasis can have a huge impact on patients' quality of life. Um, on the Psoriasis Association website, um, there is a really good short film, it's about 15 minutes long, um, called The Skin I Am, Skin I'm In, which was a storytelling um, film that was made from information gathered from 20 hours of interviews with psoriasis patients. And we were very lucky to have a performance of the film a couple of years ago, and that has stuck with me. It's a very powerful piece of work, and it really sort of explores the impact of psoriasis on on people's lives and I would really recommend anyone who hasn't watched it to watch it. And some of the information that was gathered from these interviews showed that, you know, sort of 49% of people with moderate psoriasis felt self-conscious or embarrassed going out in public. 41% have felt sad, depressed or anxious because of their condition. And 73% said they feel worse than people realise. Again, just showing that moderate disease does not have moderate impact on life. So to introduce you to the Itching to Talk guide, um, I think the tagline for this is really, you know, the skin does not always tell the full story. Um, it's always helpful. And, you know, I definitely appreciate this as a healthcare professional in kind of understanding how um, how someone's skin disease is affecting their, their everyday life. And so what the, the Itching to Talk guide does is it's really encouraging you to prepare for your consultation and virtual as well as face-to-face. -face. Healthcare's really changed over the last 18 months. Some people really like virtual consultations. Some find them challenging. I think personally they have their pros and cons. But again, I think it's still worth remembering, um, you know, that, that it's worth preparing for a virtual consultation. The guide can be printed out or it can be completed on the website and then saved and you know it also recommends that you do take photos and, and keep a diary as well. So this just sort of introduces you to the guide it's a two-page guide um, and so the first um, part is basically the bit that you ideally would do before your appointment so for instance T is asking you to think about your treatments whether they're topicals injections tablets um, how does it fit around your life um, and what sort of treatment do you need to fit into your life and again I think particularly working with topicals. I know that if somebody has a busy home life and is working long hours, then me asking somebody to put a cream on four times a day, wrap their hair in cling film for, wrap, wrap their scalp in cling film for two hours and then apply a complicated regime on a daily basis isn't gonna work. So it's really making sure that, that treatments do fit in with people's lives. A stands for achieve, and this is kind of goal setting. So what do you want to achieve? What would you, you know, do you want to be clear or do you want to return to the gym or have you a special event to attend? attend? So it's just things that you can think about before your appointment, maybe even on the way and just jot them down. L stands for lifestyle. Um, again, we've spoken that psoriasis affects the lifestyle in, in lots of different ways. But I'd go further and say that actually, you know, there, if there are ways that you can make yourself more healthy, so for instance, if you're interested in, in, in stopping smoking or reducing alcohol or maybe losing weight, there are loads of resources available in primary care. And again, if, you know, if you're seeing a healthcare professional and you are interested in any of those, it's worth asking them if they have any resources or can refer you on to other, air, uh, to other specialists. And finally, K stands for, for key body areas. So again, um, do, you know, sometimes, if you if you have genital psoriasis, you know, if if it's not asked about directly in the consultation, how, you know, 
try to mention it to your healthcare professional. Also, I would include in K is itch. Um, I think there's research that says, or I know there's research to say that healthcare professionals are sometimes not very good at asking about itch. So, you know, if itch is a problem, there are strategies that can help manage it. So it's worth mentioning that during your consultation. And then finally, um, afterwards this helps you to have a check the last part of the guide is a checklist so basically once you've had your consultation um, you can think about whether you have all the information you need for your appoint for your about your treatment um, are you confident in how to take or use your medication and I think if the answer is no we would really strongly advise you sort of seek advice um, have you confirmed when your next appointment is and also how you're going to receive it different um, uh, different clinics use different ways these days of communicating to patients sometimes it's text messages sometimes it's letters and do you know where to look for further information and I'd always say obviously that the psoriasis association and skin health and our guys and St Thomas's dermatology videos are good places to start as well and um, so I hope that's been useful um, I'll stop screen sharing my screen and apologies for the hiccup at the beginning um, thanks so so much, uh, Lucy. Um, that's um, that's great, and um, I think you make a number of important points because it it's kind of well known that there are big discrepancies between particularly what di doctors think and what their patients think, and this is a a, a, a very helpful way. So uh, thanks so so much. Um, please, folks, keep the questions coming in. Um, I've, I've got quite a few here, um, but it would be be nice to have some more. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm going to. Um, hand the stage over to my colleague, Professor Catherine Smith. Um, Catherine um, is consultant in the um, Sarasis service. Um, she's a clinical academic um, and she's led on a number of uh, national and international projects. Um, um, she, uh, many of you will have heard of SORTS and she was uh, a big research grant in the UK. Um, there's now a very similar uh, and even bigger one um, going on in Europe right now, and she's the coordinating investigator of that. Um, and more locally, uh, or nationally, I should say, uh, one thing Catherine's been doing is trying to bring together patient demographics um, and, and uh, biological specimens to try and answer many important questions about psoriasis. And I think, Catherine, you're going to talk about that now. Uh, thanks very much, Jonathan. And um, yes, I'm going to briefly talk about the bee stop study so I'm going to tell you what it is and um, our five-year plan and how we need your help um, uh, it's that we're at a very sort of exciting stage of this study so B stop stands for biomarkers and stratification to optimize outcomes in psoriasis and our overall aim of this study is to identify and characterize biomarkers to support clinical decision making and improve outcomes in psoriasis. Um, and this study was actually started with some vital seed funding from the Psoriasis Association back in 2011, uh, when in fact no one else wanted to fund it. And it's been incredibly successful. And I'm really um, delighted also to say that the Psoriasis Association throughout have, have provided absolutely core in, um, funding to this study and have also committed for the next five years vital funding so um, it, it's a really um, exciting time for this for this study. Um, a biomarker just for clarification is simply something you can measure um, often in the blood um, but also in the skin sometimes to measure some aspect of a disease and so in psoriasis, there are all sorts of aspects that we might want to know about. And you might say, why do we actually need biomarkers? Well, firstly, um, at the moment, in terms of treatment, we approach treatment as if all psoriasis is the same. Um, but we know uh, that all psoriasis is not the same. Not everybody with psoriasis is the same. And so biomarkers help us um, differentiate uh, between different people and their different psoriasis. And so the ideal is that you have a biomarker that will set us out these, I've just put here for argument's sake, four different types of psoriasis that might look the same, but aren't the same, but it, because they're molecularly different, then they will respond differently to the treatments. So the idea is that you personalize the treatment 
based on that molecular makeup. And the way we measure that molecular makeup is with so-called biomarkers. And that's where the focus of effort has been in medicine generally, and, and particularly more recently in psoriasis. But there's also other huge questions that we don't know about in that we don't know enough about triggers to psoriasis and in particular what particular triggers are important for what individual person um, and what factors drive disease progression so if someone comes to me with a small amount of psoriasis on their elbow, I have no way of knowing or discussing with that individual whether they're likely to get more severe disease or whether it's likely to go away, whether they're likely to develop psoriatic arthritis, for example. And so there's a real opportunity with biomarker research to develop tests that would help us have that information and have a more proactive approach to medicine at the moment we're, we're very reactive. Somebody presents with severe disease or they present with arthritis. So that's the whole aim of the B-STOP study is to collect clinical information and biological information, so blood, skin, and so on, and interrogate that deeply to develop and, and, and um, scale up biomarkers to help with that decision-making process. So the study is involving over 80 centers. We've got more than 7,000 participants on whom we've got a variety of biological samples. Um, that's 29,000 samples um, to date. And we collect information over time about their disease um, and also how well they're responding to treatment. And that is over the last few 10 years, that has been the focus of effort um, around understanding differences in treatment response. Um, but uh, and this, this data set is vital to really large scale research efforts. So as Jonathan mentioned, there's a psoriasis effort in the UK, but more recently we've got this huge European research effort um, where the European Union has provided us with um, a lot of money. We've got 35 participating um, investigators across Europe trying to identify biomarkers uh, in psoriasis and also eczema. And the Psoriasis Association are partners of that. And we are too, we're, we're involved in that. And the B-STOP resource is being used as one of a number of data sets to try and do this discovery work. But the five-year plan um, with the B-STOP is obviously to carry on with what we're doing, but we want to enrich um, the clinical information that we've got so that we understand more about lifestyle factors, so we can encompass all types and severities of psoriasis. So at the moment, most of the information we have is on people with more severe disease requiring tablets and injections, but, but we need and want to find out more information about people with, with less severe psoriasis, because as you've heard from Lucy, this, is, this still has a really major impact on people um, with psoriasis. And we want to understand all the different types of psoriasis. So we've got some information about pustular types, but not enough. And we also want to understand about different types where it presents. Is it mainly scalp or um, hands and feet, for example? So the different sort of manifestations. And so for this, we really will need your help. And, and we, we've, as you've heard from Satvir, the power of what we've like to talk about psoriasis citizen scientists and that um, you providing information if it's collated carefully and securely can really answer key questions uh, of importance to everyone and so we're going to be using this model to 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 launch this new phase of these stop in 2022 and we'll be asking if you will be prepared to um, link your information with the data that you have in your health record to understand what triggers to your psoriasis, lifestyle factors, all, all sorts of information. Um, and we'll be asking you to denote um, a, a sample of blood. This is all subject to consent. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any further questions, but that's where we're going in, in 2022. And we are, we're, we're really excited about it. Um, that's all, Jonathan, that's all I've got to say. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, that's great. Um, I think the, the one thing that, that brings all these three talks together is, is, is actually the word united, that this is about uh, uh, healthcare pr practitioners, researchers, scientists, um, patients and pu uh, public um, getting together to try and answer questions that, that we think are important. And 
we want to hear back from you if you agree that these 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 are important well look on on that note um, unfortunately we've come to the end so um i'd like to thank um catherine lucy um sat there um and helen for participating um i i hope you are happy with the presentations um and uh with the q a oh, well I, I want to thank the people behind the scenes that make this possible uh, uh that there, there are people who've been work allison and ruth in particular have been working you don't see them or sometimes you see them running across the floor if there's a if someone can't remember which button to press to get the slides up usually me but thank you allison um, and ruth for all of that and finally thank you the audience the ppi audience uh, for for uh, listening to us and giving up your valuable time. We really appreciate it and I hope we've been able to um, address issues that are of interest and of relevance to you. So with that, um, thank you very much indeed and good night. <laughs>